Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, Peace in the Streets, our guest, Robert Gray, is co-founder of Uhuru, an organization based here where I am in Charlottesville, Virginia. Gray is a visionary businessman, brand strategist, and social entrepreneur with a passion for education reform and economic empowerment. He's done a wide range of organizing work and in 2019 received a proclamation from Charlottesville City Council for his work in the community. He has over 10 years of experience working with high-risk youth and two years experience applying the nationally recognized evidence-based Check and Connect program within a targeted community of youth and their families here in the city of Charlottesville, Virginia, ensuring students were attending, engaging with, and investing in their education. Uhuru's Peace in the Streets program has recently received support from the city of Charlottesville. Robert Gray, welcome to Talk World Radio. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. So, so tell us about Peace in the Streets. So what is it? How did it get started? Yeah, so, uh, so Peace in the Streets, it got started with uh, five gentlemen um, who are basically natives of the Charlottesville area. Um, we all came together to you know, address the, the, the gun violence that's, that's taking place in Charlottesville or the gun violence that was taking place over the um, course of the pandemic or the beginning of the uh, pandemic. Um, so we just essentially came together, um, create, uh, created Peace in the Streets, um, and so we provide conflict resolution to the highest risk individuals um, in, in these neighborhoods that are um, somewhat perpetuating the gun violence, but then also they might be a victim of gun violence as well. So, so this so. all got started after what people around the world have heard about from Charlottesville, the right-wing Nazi rally uh, four years ago, right? Yeah, this got started. Um, so, so Peace in the Streets is a branch of the Uhuru Foundation. It's a, a, pro, uh, a new program that we started um, this year. And then what does it look like? How many people do it? What sort of training do they need to, to do it? It sounds, it sounds crazy to a lot of people for unarmed non-policemen to be going out and dealing with gun violence. You need guns for that, right? Uh, you think, right? Um, so we we, t uh, we take a slightly different approach. Uh, we don't necessarily we're not we don't send our staff you know out in these neighborhoods jumping in front of bullets. We we actually identify um, like I said the highest risk individuals and put them through a life skills class and then connect those individuals to the resources that need uh, that they need in order to be uh, successful and, and, and stable. And the, and the city government has recognized some success here, right? And they've provided some funding to, to make it bigger? So yes, the city, uh, they definitely recognize the value um, of our program. And um, I think they, they trust that we're, you know, basically doing this work at a high level. And so they invested in us and um, hopefully uh, we're able to sustain the operation over the next couple of years. Um, after we kind of like show and prove, you know, how effective uh, the strategy is that we're using. And if violence and gun violence eventually go down in Charlottesville, maybe they'll have to invest a little less in policing. Correct. Could could work out that way. Potentially. What, what uh, is this, I mean, this is something of a trend that's happening in other cities and other parts of the country and the world, right? This isn't... Uh, this isn't just in Charlottesville. Correct. So we're actually a part of a, um, what's called a, a National Coalition of uh, Credible Messenger Organizations. Um, for those who don't know, Credible Messengers are um, those who are closest to the problem, but also closest to the solution, meaning, meaning that, you know, in some cases, uh, most credible, uh, credible messengers have been basically formally incarcerated, um, they're returning citizens, or just have a deep connection to the community. Um, in which they serve. And dealing with the problem of mass incarceration is something else that your organization works on, right? You, you have a number of other programs? Yeah, we have a number of other programs. Um, our primary program is um, our Healthy, Wealthy, and Wise program in which we go inside of facilities, um, youth detention centers, youth correctional facilities, and then we also work with alternative schools um, as well, but we provide um, uh, we provide basically a curriculum around better decision making. Uh, we teach uh, workforce development, 
social entrepreneurship and, and financial literacy to um, the re-entry population and helping make that transition back into the community a lot more seamless. It's wonderful. How, how big is your organization? It's just starting up still, right? So yeah, we're about a year and a half old. And for the first year and a half, it was just me, me and my partner, Derek Rush. Uh, we both grew up together. Uh, we're both from the um, Esma area, which basically stands for East of Monticello. Um, he, you know, he spent some time incarcerated um, and we essentially just teamed up and created yeah. this organization. So it's just been us two um, as of right now. But then, you know, with the funding, the funding allows us to scale up and scale out and expand our program. So right now we're, we're working inside of three detention centers, one in Chesterfield, um, another one in Richmond City, and then Blue Ridge Detention. There's a, there's been a lot of news about Virginia prisons uh, lately, including uh, claims that they're doing away with with solitary confinement. Although the ACLU said no, they're not. Uh, do you are, is the problem of prisons in Virginia getting better or worse? Um, obviously, you see the the increase in in gun violence in in our community. So. Um, I anticipate, you know, uh, a high number of individuals in our communities uh, basically entering the, the criminal justice system. Not to say, you know, there's not already a, a good num, you know, good amount of um, people of color in in the criminal justice system, but I definitely anticipate, you know, more, you know, higher numbers of, of individuals entering the cr uh, criminal justice system um, in the next couple of years or so. Um, and then we also, we, so our organization is looking to um, start organizing around some of these issues of uh, mass incarceration. And we definitely want to um, hone in on the um, solitary confinement issue. We want to, you know, stop solitary confinement for, for youth. Um, we don't think it's good for brain development. Um, it doesn't help, um, it doesn't help young people be more productive. It doesn't, you know, help correct behavior. Yeah, um, it really just you know hurts as, them in the as, long run. As someone who works on international issues, I'm always noticing that there's only one country on earth that hasn't ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which forbids some of these things, and we're sitting in it. You know, this country. Yeah. Uh, um, it's the, a lot of work to do. What do you, uh, if I can a just ask about things related that I've been seeing in the news lately, I, I saw the former chief of police here in Charlottesville, who's now working for the University of Virginia, right next to Charlottesville, you know, did, a, did this extensive uh, racial targeting. There was a, a murder, then the suspect was simply known as a black man, and they went around asking black men all around Charlottesville for DNA samples uh, based on nothing other than them being black men. Uh, I mean, what should should this guy be running security at the University of Virginia now? Is there something wrong with with what he did? Um, I actually, I'm not familiar with that. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not familiar with that, so I, I can't really speak on something. I don't really have enough mm. information to speak on. That's that's admirable. Most people go ahead and speak. Uh, the uh, the the other thing I was that was coming to mind while you were speaking, uh, you know, when that fascist rally happened in Charlottesville, there were guns and guns fired on the streets. Uh, and even when they had, you know, anniversaries of that date, and they blocked off downtown for fear that something would happen, they had all these signs that you can't blink bring us dick or a camera or a slingshot or a knife or a tennis racket but go ahead and bring guns guns is cool and now they've changed the law so that so that the city is banning guns at least from city property and public events and the county has started talking about that and there was this big pro gun rally last week outside the county building is there i mean is there is there a problem with pro gun advocacy uh is there a is there anti-gun pushback on these on these decisions again uh, I'm, you know i'm not the the political guy I try to stay out <laughs> of the, the rough uh the left right game although i am a political science major but 
again, I try to stay away from the, the whole left right, you know, ideologies. Okay, well, let's let's talk about what you do with uh, with Uhuru, the new name of the organization. Um, what other projects are you working on, and and how can people get involved? Um, so we also train um, other credible messenger organizations up, and so um, we provide technical assistance. Uh, provide technical assistance. So you know, if there are any other organizations across the state of Virginia that want to get involved with this line of work we can help you know, facilitate those trainings and, and, and train people up to be able to go out into their communities um, and do this work at a high level as well. Yeah, and, and they should be in, in Virginia, though, to do it. Yes. Um, and and what, what does the training look like? Do people learn skills for de-escalating conflicts, for negotiating and mediating? What do, what do you have to be willing to do and, and able to learn? Yeah, so we, we go through a restorative justice training, uh, and then we also go through a credible messenger training. And yes, it's just equipping individuals with um, the tools that they need in order to you know de-escalate situations and and basically uh, mentor youth. Yeah, uh, I think we all could do with <laughs> with more such training. Um, I don't I don't know uh, if I could be a credible messenger. You have to be. Uh, you have to meet the description of a credible messenger, right? Correct. <laughs> yeah. So are you are you are you seeking out more people now? Are you are you growing? Yeah, we're growing. We look to we're looking to basically bring on more credible messengers. Um, again, the city funded our organization, and so with that, you know, part of that plan um, is to, or, or part of our plan is to essentially bring on more credible messengers to, again do this work at a high level more efficiently and effectively so do you think uh, or have there already been or do you think there might be people that you go out and work with who are high risk who later become part of the program and to themselves credible messengers yeah that's our job so uh, actually we we're working with uh, one young man who uh, just turned 18 and we're looking to basically bring him in uh, and make him a, a co-facilitator uh, at some of the programs, at some of the sites we run our program. So, yeah, and um, and he was he was locked up. He was incarcerated uh, just last year. So he'll go through a training, and then we'll mold him into a leadership position within our organization. That's great. Do you do you work with people who are currently incarcerated with the goal toward getting them involved when they're out? We don't work with people who are currently incarcerated. Uh, because a part of being the credible messenger is showing that you, you know, made that transition and transformation in your in your own um, personal life. Yeah. And, and so if you're still incarcerated, I mean, although there are situations where, you know, individuals who are incarcerated have made that transition and, and, and transformed their lives from the inside. Uh, and so I guess it's, it varies, you know, it's, it's kind of like a case by case thing. Yeah. Yeah. The... Uh it's got to have helped uh, get government support and motivate people to take an interest uh, that there's been this this news and this movement around Black Lives Matter in, in recent years, right? Even if you're not, that's not your thing. Um, right. That has to have helped wake people up to the possibility to even think through, should we be sending armed, uniformed troops into every possible situation should somebody armed and trained to shoot a gun be the person telling you not to bicycle on the sidewalk and speed in your car and so are there other possibilities um has to have helped right uh yeah i think to some degree um i studied the the political climate you know the, across the country in terms of like uh, police brutality and racial profiling the whole the whole nine um, but I think one of our um, one of our niches is, is you know that direct service with the, the individuals who, who, who come from um, these under resourced neighborhoods um, because you know of course you know we deserve justice when whenever a situation like you know George, uh, George Floyd happens right with the, the whole police brutality stuff and when a you know officer kills an unarmed black man um, we, we demand and we deserve justice, but at the same time, you know, we're working against um, basically, uh, 
you know, the, the violence that's being perpetuated within our community. Um, and so for me, I, I just want, you know, us to hold ourselves accountable um, the same way we hold these, these officers accountable. So uh, we're basically working on both sides of the spectrum, fighting both. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's, there's still today in here in Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, Robert Gray, a, a great deal of, of segregation and separation. I mean, you're working in certain neighborhoods. Do the other neighborhoods have a clue? Do people at the University of Virginia have a clue? Uh, or, or is there any involvement or support from across the city and the area? Because there's you know, the, the legal racial segregation uh, doesn't exist anymore. It's still de facto largely there, right? It was pretty, pretty separated place. Yeah, for sure. Um, Charlottesville has, has always been like that, you know. Um, I was born and raised um, in, Ed, in the Esma area, which is like 15 miles outside of Charlottesville. And so I'm basically born and raised in Albemarle County. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I've seen it my whole life, uh, even within, you know, the school system, you know, in the social realm, um, it, there's just this division. Uh, and most of the time, you know, we're divided by socioeconomic status um, for the most part. And um, I think people are very much aware of the, the gun violence that's, that's taking place in these neighborhoods. Um, you know, it comes across your your TV screen, you know, it's on the news, it's on the radio. Yeah. Um, and that was largely due to the pandemic. Uh, but, you know, racism has been happening in Charlottesville, you know, forever. And uh, I'm just happy, you know, there, you know, we have individuals out here in the community, we have activists out here in the community um, raising awareness around um, the racism that, the level of racism that exists in Charlottesville. And I, and I think there are people um, here in Charlottesville across the board who who definitely want to do the right thing and, and def definitely want to help contribute to to making this place more equ equitable for for everyone yeah what can what can people do to help who are not the credible messengers or are busy or don't know much about it but want to help in some way um, always always uh, my saying is uh, wealth, wisdom, or the willingness to work. So you have resources that you can extend to, to grassroots organizations who are on the front line doing this work. Yeah. Um, that could look like money, that could look like offering your time to teach financial literacy, that could look like, you know, you know, helping some of these youth with a, you know, employment opportunity. Um, that could also be, you know, doing research around um, the work that we're doing and, and serving as a thought partner. So there's multiple ways you can help, um, you know, organizations such as ours grow and expand yeah. and really be able to, you know, um, shine a beacon of light on the community as a whole. What's the, what's the website or the way to get in touch with your organization? Right now it's the uh, ConsciousCapitalistFoundation.org. Um, I don't know if I explained this earlier, but we're going through a, a name change. Um, our organization was the Conscious Capitalist Foundation, but we changed it to the Uhuru Foundation, which essentially means um, freedom in Swahili. And our tagline is discipline before freedom, but with freedom comes responsibility. So What's the, so the, the, the old name and the still the website is Conscious Capitalist Foundation. Right, so we're in the process of updating. So everything should be done um, in terms of marketing wise everything should be updated um, in the next couple of weeks or so so it'll be the uhuru foundation.org but right now it is the conscious capitalist foundation.org great Cha name changed because not everybody's a super fan of capitalism or uh, because you liked the name uhuru or? well um truthfully um we got an email from someone on the conscious capitalist I want to say it's the there's a company called Conscious Capitalism uh -huh. or something like that, and so the name was trademark, and <laughs> capitalism we, itself. Right, exactly. It's so cliche, but we actually drew inspiration from. Um, I read the book Conscious Capitalism from um, by John Mackey, um, who's the basically former CEO of uh, Whole Foods, and he sits on the board of of this company, and uh -huh. so uh, yeah, they hit us up and they wanted us to essentially change the name, but then they offered us like a 
uh, potential collaboration, uh, potential partnership. And so, oh yeah, we changed the name. We, I feel like, you know, Uhuru kind of fits our organization a little more at this point, uh, with the work we're doing. And uh, yeah, just excited about, you know, doing this work under, under the name change. Well, I like the new name, and people can can learn a new word. Um, right. <laughs> uh, the uh, the other thing Charlottesville's been in the news for lately is finally taking down all the monuments, uh, which a lot of people saw as big symbols of racism and acceptance of racism, and I also saw as glorifications of war. They're all war monuments, which is why they couldn't take them down for years. You right. can't take down a war monument gonna make much difference uh, to people in the city uh, gonna change attitudes at all um that's tough man you think about it like you know symbolism is is huge um but i was always taught that you know um politics without economics is um, merely symbol without substance so you know i'm more so about the the economic liberation um of the under underserved and yeah. individuals who don't really have a voice as opposed to you know the semantics that that can be played around like symbolism and taking statues down yeah but they both serve their purpose yeah what do you what do you think uh, what do you think the city the county the people of the area should be should be focused on doing the most what needs what needs changing the most um there's a lot of things that need change um like I said, I'm I'm a big I'm passionate about economic justice, um, but then also, you know, equity within like our educational system. So, I'm I'm just like I've been working with young people for the past ten years. So, that's where my work is. You know, that's what I'm most passionate about. Yeah, yeah. and so people people who want to help with education, you mentioned financial literacy. There may be other, I mean, there are people around this area who are skilled and expert at all kinds of fields. And there's a right. big university and a couple of big hospitals and all kinds of businesses. Yeah. Can people contribute their, their skills uh, that way or contact you and find out? Yeah, I'm always, I'm open for, you know, collaboration, for partnerships. If it makes sense, then, you know, we can move forward with the partnership. If not, then, you know, likely I'll, you know, pass you along to another organization that might be doing some of the work. Yeah, terrific. Um, what else uh, What else should people know, and what advice would you have if somebody wants to start up a similar organization in some other part of the world, uh, not near us here in Virginia? Uh, how, do you, how do you go about getting something like this started? Um... I think the, the the first thing is you have to have a real connection with genuine people, a genuine people, with the, the masses of the people who are considered the you know at the bottom, the the under resourced. Like we have genuine connections with people in this community because we come from these communities. So um, yeah. that's the first thing. And then the second thing is you have to be research and um, you have to know what you're talking about. You know, you have to know what you're doing, you can't be, you know, there's a saying that says, the the man with the, um, the man with the experience isn't at the fate of the man with the opinion. So, um, you know, part of being a credible messenger is having a certain experience. So you're not second guessing, you know exactly what's what because you've been through certain situations in, in your life. And, yeah. Yeah. Are they? You, know, you have first hand knowledge, first hand experience. Are, is it mostly or exclusively men involved or what about women right now uh it's it's predominantly men that we're working with but we're definitely looking to partner with um women who who, who are basically doing some of the work um and helping them start organizations um similar to ours as well so yeah um gun violence obviously is a big issue nationally and everybody's got opinions and some people have some degree of experience too but uh, uh, in a lot of people's opinion a big part of the problem is how easy it is to buy the darn things uh, is is any sort of uh, you know restriction on how easy it is to get guns going to help much uh, or is it more a problem of the lives people are leading that motivate them to to go out and engage in violence 
Um, that's a good question. Let me let me think about that and okay. get back with you on if you if you decide to invite me back. Sure, I sure. I have an answer for you. Okay, because uh, you know we've got a we've got a Congress and a president that promised various changes, and like every other issue, they haven't kept their promises yet. But uh, it, it seem it seems like you know making it more difficult to get the guns couldn't hurt when you're when you're dealing with the problem of gun violence. Yeah, but I mean, I look look at that through the you you got to look at it through the lens of you know through equity, through the lens of equity. I mean, you know, most crimes are, or at least say 90% of crimes are money related. And so I, I always say that the fight isn't on, you know, we don't, there's not a fight on a criminal justice system or mass incarceration. The fight is with poverty, right? You have millions of people living in poverty who are in survival mode, who don't really know, you know, where their next meal will come from. And then you're throwing, then you're adding, um, you know, guns and all the you know everything else to 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 that problem of of poverty and so then you just get like total chaos and so we're living from a, a scarcity mindset and, and a lot of these under-resourced neighborhoods and so you know our work is you know getting people prepared to to basically be productive and a, a huge component of that is you know entrepreneurship employment you know, we're teaching yeah. financial literacy, active income versus passive income, right? Um, mutual fund, stock market, like these type of things. Um, just having a mindset, an entrepreneur, entrepreneur mindset. And, um, yeah. And basically uh, being financially aware. I still got the political mindset. I'm hearing, what about those promises to tax the rich and make college free and cancel student debt and all these other things we, uh, we haven't got yet? Politics is a, is a dirty game, man. We we know that. So. It's a dirty game, but I'd like to see a few good things come out of it instead of all these bad things that are making worse and worse. We got just a minute left, Robert Gray, uh, from the Uhuru Foundation. The currently the website is Conscious Capitalist Foundation. Uh, what what can people uh, do to stay in touch and and follow up with what you're working on? Uh, yeah, you can right as of right now. Um, you can follow us on Facebook. Um, our Facebook is the Conscious Capitalist Foundation. Instagram, um, it's C C Foundation Incorporated. So I N C. So C C Foundation um, Inc. And those are the only two social media platforms we currently have at the moment. So, but that's how you can get in get but, in touch. But developing and growing and getting bigger. Uh, Robert Gray with uh, the Uhuru Foundation. Thank you very very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.